Uh, it's time to say a very good afternoon to an old mate of mine from many years ago from the Olympic Games and uh, Radio Sport, Mark Watson, who's got a few things on his mind. He also, I don't think he's, um, well, I think he's very unhappy about what's happening to the Kona Ironman, this I iconic event up there in Hawaii every year, uh, which really was the very first Ironman, the, the swim, the long cycle leg, and you finish with the marathon. Anyway, Watto, uh, I know you're a regular here on Martin's show, but you and I haven't seen each other for a while. Nice to talk to you again. Yeah, lovely to catch up, Brendan. Yeah, 2008, uh, what a privilege it was. My first Olympic Games, a childhood dream come true, and I remember sitting there at a dinner table with you, Peter Williams, uh, John Macbeth, um, and I think it might have also been Peter Montgomery and I was just sort of almost in awe of you guys because I'd grown up listening to you and there I was, this sort of very green sort of commentator that was going over there to do expert comments surrounded by these sort of icons and and, and fairness, and still to this very day I've got nothing but respect and I still admire all of you guys. And it's still held against me by my colleagues, former colleagues from Radio Sport, that whenever they were having a bitching session about Mark Watson, they'd always say, Telfer, it's your fault. You dragged that guy in here and got him some work here, didn't you, after the Olympic Games back in 2008, which I think I did. I think you said to me as we departed, I think you were going back to Europe where you were based, uh, that you were coming home to New Zealand and you wouldn't mind doing a bit of radio sport work, which you'd been listening to online from, I think, where you were in France or somewhere. Yeah. And so that's how it started, isn't it? That's, uh, I, I launched your mega career in broadcasting. Yeah, you did, and I think there was also a little bit of influence in the background of the bit of television with Murray Deeker on the Deeker on Sport off the back of those Olympics, and um, I sort of got a bit of a twinkle in his eye. It's funny, though, isn't it, Brendan, how you suddenly come along, you have an opinion, you're outspoken, and suddenly people start talking about you negatively or positively, and... Um yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a strange relationship that you can sometimes have with your uh, colleagues. Mm. And I'll be fair, even I still do a bit of work across different radio stations, and it's amazing the moment you have an opinion. Um, yeah, people are not afraid to uh, come after you, uh, even though they don't necessarily know you as a person. Mm. Anyway, I know there's a few things on your mind, but one thing I'd like to talk to you about, and it's timely that we should have you on the air today because it's been in the news for the past week, this w- w- shock that has reverberated through the triathlon world with the news that Kona, this iconic, it's the equivalent, I suppose, to the Masters Golf, but uh, in terms of triathlons, it's the home, if you like, of uh, the original Iron Man, and it's in recent years, for a number of years now, has been the World Championship uh, Iron Man, but it's undergone a quite a radical change, and it won't be anything like what it's been in the past. In fact, I think the men are only going to race there every second year. Is that right? Yeah, look, this is just an absolute disaster. So Hawaii is where really the origins of triathlon started back in 1978, and it's become the absolute race that you want to win. You win Hawaii and you've got your place in history and you'll become financially pretty well off because of what you'll be able to pick up through endorsements. And what's always made Hawaii so unique is that, you know, it's always a 3.8-kilometre swim, a 180-kilometre bike ride and a 42-kilometre run. But you put it in the extreme conditions of the big island where, you know, no wetsuit swim, historically 1500 athletes on the start line gladiatorial swim and then you've got the crosswinds out on the bike you can hit 115 degrees fahrenheit you get off in the afternoon and you've got high humidity 35 degrees and then you know at the elite level you're also racing your fellow competitors and it, for those reasons you know it's sort of greater than the sum of its parts and uh, and you, then you had the great battles between mark allen and dave scott um you, you've had um, you know, so many wonderful showdowns over the years. Greg Welch, the first non-American to win it in 1994. And then the big German contingent coming through. Our own Aaron Baker having won it in 87 and 1992. Cameron Brown, two seconds and two thirds up there. And look, it was always my childhood dream. And I was lucky enough to do the race in 93, 97 and 2001. And um, you always thought, you know, this is this is the sports, this is the sports Wimbledon, as you alluded to. This is its Masters in golf, and then suddenly, you know, Ironman races around the world became more and more prevalent. Uh, there are a lot more of them, and what they started to do was they, at every race around the world, they have a number of qualifying spots, and as more races have become available, more demand to do Hawaii that 
it started to lose its way a little bit. It went from sort of 1,500 athletes to 2,500. And the problem when you start getting above 2,500 athletes, Brendan, is that you start to get a lot of drafting going on on the bike because it's only 90 kilometres out, 90 kilometres back on the bike. And it was always a non-drafting race. It was always a race about integrity, the best athlete across three disciplines. And so you'd start to see these times getting a lot quicker because people would be sitting in bunches, not maybe riding as hard, being able to run a little bit quicker and all the rest of it. And then it's got to the point now where, you know, clearly, I mean, the price of entry is around about 1600 US dollars just to enter the damn race if you do qualify. And it's just become this giant corporation. And like any giant corporation, it's all about the bottom line. It's all about the dollar. And so what they've done now is they're saying, well, hey, let's have two and a half, three thousand. Let's get women out there one year. Let's get men out there the following year. Um, the year that the women are not racing will have their world championships in Nice and the year that the men are not racing will have their world championships in Nice and it's just completely and utterly bastardised one of the great sporting events and it's it's shameful Um, I don't think they've realised the intangible damage that they've done to the sport I haven't seen one positive comment in favour of it Um, you know my opinion is Brendan you maybe take it to 2,000, you pick 20 races a year geographically, you offer them 100 spots each in qualifying, you might rotate it every year in terms of what if you to get the qualifying spots. And if you're good enough, you're one of the 2,000. If you're not good enough, you don't go. But, you know, we've had people qualifying for this race, doing half Ironman events that come under the Ironman Corporation. We've rewarded athletes who have done 10 Ironmans around the world who actually might not be even good enough to really compete at this level, been given spots and... Yeah, it, it's really, really sad because you, you take a guy like a Braden Curry, Brendan, who, you know, is New Zealand's leading Ironman athlete at the moment. Uh, you know, I think he's good enough to go close to winning it. He's missed two years because of COVID. This well, he, ha- he has Ivan gone Ray. close to winning it in the past, hasn't he? Yeah, he's finished fifth and he put himself in contention to mm. win it and probably could have gone top three, but in trying to win it, he blew up. Mm. But but also, Brendan, you know, he's missed, he got COVID this year in great shape. And then so he's looking forward to next year going, hey, I've got a chance, I've got a chance in 223. Well, he's not. Now he's going to have to wait until he's 224. But when you're in your sort of mid to late 30s, you know, and I know, Brendan, that, you know, a, a year is a long, long time in terms of being at your you know, that ripe, that ripe age versus that sort of slightly older age. Yeah, well, it's a change, I suppose, is sweeping the sporting world all the time. And it goes, I guess you inevitably link it with the um, money that comes into a sport. And um, maybe we just have to accept that. If you want the sport to develop, uh, it has to embrace change. And inevitably, in professional sport, embracing change means more money coming into the sport. So... That's the other side of the story. I imagine it's a good thing, isn't it, that these athletes, including the Braden Curries, he might be able to win more money now because of these changes that are taking place, right? Well, that's it. You'd think so, Brendan, but there doesn't seem to be that. There doesn't seem to be more money being offered anymore. Oh, okay. I it just thought... seems to be going... Because, you know, Iron Man is a private corporation. This is not some sort of global international body like FIFA. Mm. It's not the ITU who govern the sport. This is a private corporate who have shareholders, who have investors, who just want to see a return and want to see a large return. Um, But look, Hawaii, it's never been about the money. The money comes by winning it. It's like the Tour de France, you know. They split the prize money. This prize money goes to amongst the team riders and the guy that wins the yellow jersey, well, he's going to make a million dollar in endorsements. And that's what Hawaii is ultimately all about. I mean, they can put whatever spin on it they want. They can say that, look, oh, this is just a chance to put women at centre stage. But the women have always been centre stage at Hawaii. They've always stood alongside of the men in terms of the coverage that they get. The yeah, OK. That I, they I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. But when I, I look across a lot of sports, um, the you know, this lament that you're expressing here could apply virtually to all of the sports that uh, we particularly like in New Zealand. When you go back to what happened in rugby in the mid-1990s when we abandoned basically amateur rugby and embraced professional rugby and the sort of complaints that I'm hearing from you now were exactly the sort of complaints that uh, were commonplace in the mid-1990s. Rugby had sold its soul. It had lost connection with its roots and it had been sold out to the highest bidder and all of this money rushed into the game and a few rugby players are going to get very wealthy but the great bulk of rugby players are going to suffer and to some
some degree that's happened. Club rugby is hanging on by the skin of its teeth. It's almost extinct in some parts of the country. But you look at the overall picture, and I don't think anyone would want to go back to rugby in the 1980s. Cricket, I suppose you could see what... Um, BBL or the IPL or T20 has done to traditional cricket. It has, to use your word, bastardised uh, the beauty and the traditions of the old game of cricket. Test matches, which are still, again, hanging on but by the skin of their teeth. And so it's not surprising in some ways that triathlon has had to go through the same process. But I think probably in the end uh, it will produce more money, more exposure for the top contenders and it's the difficulty we have in I, I guess coming to terms with this wrenching change which is taking place and now you know yeah. tennis has gone through it golf's gone through it you look at live golf what that's done to golf um and now you look at um what's happening in your sport yeah but they haven't looked i agree with what you're saying brendan but you've got an iconic a one-off iconic eat here which is the blue ribbon, which is steeped in. But it's not. It's not. It's not being Cannot buy back. It's not being abandoned, though, is it? It's no, not, it's not being abandoned. But it's very different to what it once was. You'll never see tennis mess with Wimbledon to any degree that what they're doing with the Hawaiian Ironman. You'll never see the major golf tournaments and the men's saying reducing it to three rounds or, uh, or, or uh, reducing okay, it to well, a field of twenty or twenty-five. Anyway. You won't. Liv might do it, but you're not going to see it. They've taken one of the arguably the hardest single one day race in the world and completely destroyed it all in the name of corporate uh, and commercial greed. This is not about the best interests of the athletes. This is the best interests of the pure capitalists. Hey, Hello, I do go back to some famous words made by John Fitzgerald Kennedy in his inauguration speech in early 1964, in January in 64, when he was inaugurated as president and he talked about what he wants to do and where he wants to take America and he came up with this great line change is the law of life that if you cannot come to terms with change if you cannot adapt to change in the modern world you will perish but anyway let us move on speaking of and, and brendan and brendan and then he was assassinated <laughs> yeah well okay okay anyway let's move on speaking of change look at the change that um stokes and mccullum have made to test cricket in recent weeks and what we're seeing in pakistan is extraordinary isn't it i mean although um i was watching the final acts of that test match last night which england won in just and what seems to be happening to me is it's fantastic what england are doing getting all these runs very quickly but it's giving the opposition so much more time <laughs> to get runs as well. And so England have won these two tests, uh, but only by the skin of their teeth. So I'm not sure whether it's necessarily uh, the holy grail scoring runs at a very quick pace when you bat first in a test match. Yeah, it's interesting reading this. So they've won eight out of nine tests now, England, and prior to that, I think they'd won one out of about 17. 17 yeah. Brendan, mm. yeah, Brendan McCullum's come along and he said, look, when we look at Ollie Pope, we look at the likes of Crawley, um, the likes of Stokes and stuff, we don't necessarily have a group of players who have the ability to occupy the crease for a long period of time. So why do we play a game based on... Uh, a style that's not suited to our batters. Let's go after this. Let's give ourselves a chance. Let's change the game. And Brennan's from day one, he said, look, Test Cricket's the Holy Grail. We've got to keep this interesting. We've got to keep people coming along. Because, I mean, you look at cricket at the moment, and they've got to ask some serious questions. I mean, where's, how do they find the romance of the 1980s and 1990s with the coloured clothing? It seems to have gone completely. One day cricket's nowhere. I think T20 cricket, yes, it provides a little bit of uh, entertainment, but there's no legacy. There's nothing memorable about winning anything. And then suddenly, so you go, what's left? And so test cricket, I think McCullum and these guys, Ben Stokes, these guys are game changers. These guys are taking the sport in a completely different direction. Now, it's going to be up to other sides around the world whether they want to buy into it or they just want to set their sides up saying, right, what's the weakness in the way England play this game? But I'll be honest, I don't watch a lot of cricket, but I have been riveted by the last two England-Pakistan tests. Mm. I am so looking forward to the Ashes next year in England when Australia yeah. come over, who are very good at belittling it. How will England perform against New Zealand here? Um, and then you look at New Zealand, on the other hand, you go Gary Seed, Kane Williamson, and you almost fall asleep just talking about the two names. I mean, we we are so conservative. We've lost that edge. And look, even when McCullum was captaining, we saw New Zealand go on a bit of a golden run. And so, look, I think the way they're playing it is the right way. Um, we talked about Ironman. We talked about evolution. 
um, this is not an evolution. This is a revolution. And um, whether you like the name or not, I think Baz Ball is here to stay. I think so, although, you know, you largely dismiss T20 and 50 over cricket, but in actual fact, what's happened here is that McCullum and Stokes have uh, embraced uh, the fundamentals of limited over cricket scoring runs in a hurry and have threaded that into the kind of, I, I suppose, the DNA of test cricket. And uh, whether it will survive or not, I don't know, but scoring 500 runs a day in test cricket is just something that I still can't get my head around. But anyway, it's it's a fascinating time and it's uh, he certainly has stirred up a lot of interest in test cricket. But as you say, that's what I'm waiting for, to see how England approach the venerated pursuit of the Ashes, the most hallowed, uh, hallowed, I suppose, acquisition in cricket, probably more important to English cricket fans and even a, a world championship title or a World Cup. But um, we'll have to wait and see until next year. We were going to touch on the Helberg Awards, um, whatever, but we've run out of time. But I will do that um, next Monday for sure and uh, have a look at what's been happening in New Zealand sport this year and where those gongs might go. In the meantime, I thank you very much indeed for your time. You have a good week. Yeah, thank you, Brendan. Just for a couple of things, mate. Just keep your elbows high when you're swimming, soft hands, head down when you're playing golf, and just don't push too big a gear when you're riding your bike. <laughs> okay. I'll try and remember all of those things. There's only about 15 things you have to remember when you hit a golf ball, um, and it's a bit like that with uh, swimming as well. And um, I'm trying to think, it's actually going to bring up a Mark Bone or someone and try and work out for, with a conversation of how I can swim faster as I'm getting older. But I don't think you can, can you? Well, Brendan, no, you can. It's all technique, mate. I keep saying that if an 11-year-old girl can go in and beat up some big muscle-bound guy who started swimming in his 20s, it says it's all hydrodynamics. So it's all technique. Okay. It's not a power game. It's all about flexibility, Brendan. It's about time in the water. It's not about procrastination, Brendan. Mm, good stuff. I'll try and remember that when I'm in the pool tomorrow. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for your time. I'll talk to you again next week. You're welcome.